it causes what we call cavitation, which is these small little micro bubbles that form, and they all form and coagulate and coalesce, and eventually have so much energy built up that they mechanically just break down the tissue right there. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Hello, friend. Today on Dog Cancer Answers, we're learning about an emerging treatment that provides hope for bone cancer and soft tissue sarcoma patients. It's a non-surgical technique that uses sound waves and tiny bubbles to destroy tumors. It is so interesting. To explain what high-intensity focused ultrasound is and how it works, we're joined by Dr. Joanne Tui of the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Tech. She's a board-certified surgeon, but this particular type of treatment does not involve a scalpel. Dr. Tui, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. So tell us what high-intensity focused ultrasound is. Yes, so high-intensity focused ultrasound as an umbrella term refers to very specialized ultrasound waves that are being investigated and in some of its forms used clinically to treat various types of diseases, so cancers included. And some of the studies that you may have come across have reported its use in people. And um, we currently also have clinical studies, investigative studies into its use for our veterinary patients. So I know what an ultrasound is from my own experience of, you know, they put a a little gel on you, they wave a wand, and they can take basically images that sort of look kind of x-ray-ish, but they're moving. They can see everything. And it's basically using sound waves to map out the internal soft structures. Is that correct? Yes. So that kind of ultrasound we generally refer to as diagnostic ultrasound. Uh Uh-huh. And so... Absolutely. Those are ultrasound waves. And the reason for the gel is because these ultrasound waves don't travel as well through air. And so we've got that gel that gets squeezed onto us and that's to reduce that interface of the air. And so the ultrasound probe can directly be on the gel and image the soft tissue structures and bone as well. Mm -hmm. So ultrasound can be used to image bone. It's much more challenging, but Yes, it's a very common diagnostic modality. Okay, but this is something different. This is a treatment modality, and it's using high-intensity focused. So can you explain a little bit about how that changes what we're thinking of when we think of ultrasound? Yes. So waves come in different wavelengths and durations of waves, different pulses, etc. And so with the diagnostic ultrasound waves, The type of waves that are generated by the ultrasound probe are sufficient to enable visualization of the internal structures. But these waves do not have the ability, the energy, to be able to break down or destroy tissue, which is good. We only want to be looking at them. We don't want to do anything hurtful to the tissues. So the focus ultrasound is different in that its purpose is completely different. Mm-hmm. So we're not using this high intensity focus ultrasound to look at deep structures just for diagnostic purposes. The purpose of this HIFU is to, at least with what we're doing with our applications in veterinary cancer, is to try and kill the cancer cells. With sound waves. Yes, exactly. With these ultrasound waves. So It's the type of waves that has to be generated by very specialized ultrasound probes. So I couldn't just go to the diagnostic ultrasound probe, take that and expect that to be able to generate high intensity sound waves. Okay, that's good to hear. Yes. (laughs) So these are very high intensity pulses, which can contain a lot of energy. And so when these specialized ultrasound waves get transmitted into the body, There are also ways in which the probe or the transducer, you know, if you think of a diagnostic ultrasound probe, it's just a single probe we hold in our hand Mm -hmm. and put it on the body. So these high-intensity focused ultrasound probes 
are very specialized so that they can focus from various angles almost, so to speak. So they focus onto a single point Mm. within the body, whichever our target is, which is usually the tumor. And when there is an accumulation of these sound waves and there is a high enough energy buildup, then it causes what we call cavitation, which is these small little micro bubbles that form and they all form and coagulate and coalesce and eventually have so much energy built up that they mechanically just break down the tissue right there and disintegrates that tissue. That's incredible. Yes, it's really the engineering aspects of this are really, it's very ingenious. And so that's what we use the high food for. So that's the difference. We don't use it to visualize and diagnose features or structures. We're using it specifically to destroy tissue. That is incredible with ultrasound waves. Yes. That are highly focused. Yes. Okay. So the focusing comes from the special instrument that you're using that attacks from many different, it doesn't have a wide field. It's going very specifically sort of in towards the target, which Mm -hmm. I assume you're using some sort of a mapping technology to program the machine. Is it like that, like in radiation where they program it to say, send this laser beam to this point? and this other laser beam to that point and kind of get at it from a bunch of angles? Yes. So I think that's a really good analogy, radiation treatment. So exactly, the transducer for high-intensity focused ultrasound is controlled by very sophisticated software, as you can imagine. And the treatment planning is done beforehand. So we have CT imaging, for example, okay. for the studies that we are conducting or MRI imaging. Okay. And so we already can see the tumor. And based on those images, my collaborators are the bioengineers. They are amazing bioengineers. They are the ones who will then enter that treatment plan that they have designed for each individual patient's tumor into the software, which then directs that transducer to deliver the focus of the ultrasound waves to exactly where we want it to go. And we can monitor this this delivery in real time. Oh, wow. With diagnostic ultrasound imaging. So the other type of imaging that we talked about. And in people, the MRI has also been used to monitor treatments in real time as well. And so... Yeah, it's really nice to be able to see, you know, oh gosh, yes, this is, for example, an ultrasound, we can see those micro bubbles. We call it the bubble cloud or the cavitation cloud. And it shows up as a white, very bright spot on the ultrasound screen. That's incredible. So an ultrasound is a very safe technology for the technician who's administering it. In diagnostic, ultrasound is a very safe technology. Is this high intensity focused ultrasound similarly very safe for the people who are administering it? Because radiation treatments are not safe for the people who are administering it, but is this safe? Well, so in terms of radiation, ionizing radiation waves, Mm -hmm. so these ultrasound waves do not have that ionizing radiation. So in that sense, yes, So, for example, the people who deliver radiation or do x-rays or do CTs, you know, obviously they have to have guidelines for their own protection. Right. Step out of the room and there's lots of safety protectors for them as well. Yeah, exactly. But the high-intensity focused ultrasound can be delivered without the people who deliver them needing to step away due to the any kind of ionizing radiation effect of the waves. That's wonderful. So a dog wouldn't be left alone in a room, even just for a few seconds, that they are left alone during, say, a radiation treatment. And we wouldn't have to worry about the health of the technician who's delivering, say, chemotherapy is often something that we worry about the long-term side effects for people who are administering chemotherapy. So this is why it's called non-invasive and non-toxic, right? Well, it's certainly non-invasive. Okay. It can be. And non-ionizing meaning there isn't radiation. Mm -hmm. You know, just to be absolutely proper, I think non-toxic might cover too wide of an umbrella. Okay. Because currently, 
in our clinical trials, which is why they're clinical trials. We're trying to find information. Right. This is not yet available as a treatment that you can just get in your veterinarian's office at this moment. Correct. Right. These are not standard of care treatment. So we are still investigating, you know, are there possible side effects of the treatment? So that's the only reason why I say non-toxic might be a bit too broad of an umbrella. We don't quite want to say that yet. Hopefully yes. it will be, but yeah. hopefully okay. it will be, but certainly non-ionizing. Yes, absolutely. It doesn't have any ionizing radiation associated with it. So for the person delivering, definitely we don't have to have those kinds of precautions and guidelines in place for protection of, against ionizing radiation. So let me ask, when your engineers are programming the HIFU treatment, if there are structures in between the source of the ultrasound waves and the tumor itself, are those impacted as the ultrasound waves go through them? Or is there a way to avoid that? Are there certain areas of the body you wouldn't be able to use this with because it would cause damage on the way in? Like, how does that work? Wonderful question. So there are many, kind of many aspects to the answer to your question, many aspects to your question. So yes, you are absolutely correct. So if we've got a tumor that is, let's say, deeper in under the skin, so there is skin, there is um, muscle, in the way, maybe some subcutaneous fat in the way. So yes, there are intervening tissues usually. Even if it's a tumor that's very superficial in the skin, the skin's in the way. Right. So the purpose of this HIFU is to be able to target our treatment such that we do not damage the intervening tissues along the way. So the focus where the ultrasound waves eventually create that cloud of microbubbles occurs where we want it to occur, which is only in the tumor that we direct it to. So as the ultrasound waves travel for various reasons, one of which is different tissue types actually have different thresholds, you might think of it, for forming these bubble clouds. Okay. And so if we can program the threshold to be suitable for just the tumor, that's one way in which we can avoid damage to intervening structures or innocent bystanders, so to speak. I want to make sure I understand what you just said, because it truly sounds like science fiction to me, and I want to make sure that I understood yes. it. What I heard you say is that the sound waves are different wavelengths, different intensities, different patterns, however that works, but they're different types of ultrasound waves. And you can program them so that, say, one can be intense enough to affect a bone tumor, but it would not actually affect the skin and the muscles in between because those tissues can simply tolerate that ultrasound wave, whereas the bone tumor couldn't. Am I getting that right? Yes, I believe so. So it's not so much that they're different types of waves as they travel through the different tissues. It's the same waves. Right. It's different tissue thresholds, if you want to think of it that way. So different tissues will have different thresholds at which the high-intensity focused ultrasound waves will adversely affect them. And just to give you an example, and this information has been published in a recent paper where we use the same quote-unquote dose of this focused ultrasound, the HIFU, and this is a non-thermal type of HIFU. Okay, so non-heat. It's not hot. Not heat, yes. Okay. High-intensity focus ultrasound can come in two big categories. One is destroying tissue by heat. Uh-huh. And then the non-thermal kind, which is what I've been describing to you, and I apologize for not making that clear, this is the way in which we destroy tissue with this type of non-thermal HIFU. Okay. By creating the microbubbles and disintegrating the tissue. Mm-hmm. Versus the thermal HIFU, which are, again, a different wavelength, different type of ultrasound wave. That type of HIFU destroys tissue and cells with heat by thermal methods. So okay. this is non-thermal HIFU. And so now let me go back to where I was talking about the manuscript data, where we use the same dose of non-thermal HIFU, or it's called histotripsy. Okay. That we established a dose that would break down the bone cancer cells. Mm-hmm. And we use that same dose, so to speak, mm -hmm. to target a normal bone tissue 
and normal nerves. Okay. And showed that at least when a pathologist looks at the tissue under the microscope, the non-thermal HIFU or histotripsy does not appear to damage that tissue. This is incredible. So you're saying this treatment, HIFU, non-thermal, can destroy that bone tumor, but not the bone surrounding it. Right. If it's a, a normal bone. So for example, one of the really exciting potential for how precise we can make this non-thermal HIFU treatment is how we can avoid big blood vessels, for example, critical structures that we don't want to hurt or traumatize. Right. So for example, in liver tumors, the liver is full of big blood vessels. So the use of these non-thermal HIFU strategies with its precision, we can treat liver tumors and be able to spare damage to the blood vessels that might be running close by. That's incredible. Yeah. And very, and very recently, within the last month or so, the first paper just got published for use of this non-thermal high four histotripsy for use in a clinical trial in people for treating liver tumors in people in Spain. Very exciting report. So what happens after the bubble cluster forms and the tumor is destroyed? What happens to that destroyed tumor? How does the body manage that? Are there side effects to this? Is there damage that the dog or the human feels as a result of this treatment? That's a great question. Another great question. And I think that there are, of course, unknowns. You know, it's such a new technology. We don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. But what I can report to you is that with some of the preclinical studies that have been done with the breakdown of the tumor by this high food, Mm -hmm. For one, we theorize and we have some of this preclinical data to support our hypotheses is that the tumor now is broken down and so fragments of the tumor are now available for the immune cells to recognize them and be able to mount a better immune response against the tumor. So these are the host, the patient's own immune cells. So that is one downstream effect that we are hoping we can see with the use of this technology. We see in our preclinical data in the study that was reported in Spain, Mm -hmm. you know, this is in patients, clinical patients. So we have data based off of sequential MRI imaging. Okay. So I couldn't tell you molecularly what was happening to the tumor. Right. This is all visual. Yes, but it shows that the tumors that were treated, they had decreased in size. And also in one of the patients, one of the other tumors that was not treated appeared also to be decreasing in size. So suggesting that maybe there is truly some kind of immune response. We don't know that for sure. Right. But some of these early, very preliminary observations that have been made are exciting. So we don't know for certain, you know, I couldn't make a statement. We will stimulate that immune response and have a great anti-cancer response from the immune system. But our early preclinical as well as preliminary data that we're seeing, for example, out of this study in Spain, is exciting. It suggests that there is a chance that the immune system can be stimulated by these tumor fragments that get released. That's very exciting. And it makes sense because obviously when the tumor breaks up, the immune system doesn't just fight cancer. It also cleans up messes in the body. Right. You know, like it heals things. So it goes, oh, right. there's something over there that needs to be healed or addressed or cleaned up. Goes over there, says, oh, my word. I'm personifying the immune system as if it's a person. <laughs> but oh, my goodness, there's all of these little tumor fragments. We better inspect the area and mount a defense and make sure we clean this up really well. So I can see how logically, from a biological basis, it makes sense that this might be something that's happening. You go in there, you ablate a tumor, and all the other tissues are normal. And it sort of says to the immune system, there's a problem, but it's not everywhere. It's right here. It sort of tags that spot. Yes. This is so exciting. I imagine that a dog would need to have anesthesia in order to stay really still Mm -hmm. so that waves go where you want them to go. Is that right? 
Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's a light anesthesia, just like we would give to a dog who has to undergo a CT or an MRI scan. Oh, okay, so it's not general anesthesia. It is general anesthesia. Okay. But we just need a patient to lay still. It's just not deep, you know, versus surgical anesthesia. When I do surgery, I need my patient to be deep under anesthesia. So this is a light anesthesia because just like when we give radiation treatment to a, a dog, or a cat, we can't afford for them to move because we don't want to radiate the wrong spot. Right. And so similarly, we can't have them move so that we don't accidentally treat the wrong spot that we don't intend to treat. So yes, they do have to undergo a general anesthesia. How long does the treatment take? So at the moment, with our early studies that we have, treatment of a bone tumor, for example, osteosarcoma, for about, you know, a pretty small volume of tumor, we are probably looking at about a 30 minute treatment. 30 as in three zero, half an hour. Yep. Half an hour. So that's one of the areas of investigation that we are pursuing, which is, well, the general we, which is mostly our bioengineering collaborators, because it's much more based in bioengineering is to design these transducers and the whole histotripsy or the high food delivery system to decrease the delivery time so that eventually we can treat larger and larger tumors. Oh, because is it the anesthesia that's limiting the amount of time you can spend in the treatment or is it? Yeah, because, um, you know, as much as possible, I would like to avoid having patients under general anesthesia for extended, for long, long periods of time. And so it's a balance between, you know, if the benefits, pros and cons of a treatment, we have to strike a nice balance with that. Right. And so ideally our treatment times will be as short as possible to limit the amount of time a patient may be under anesthesia. The anesthesia, we can't help. We can't help it. They have to have it, but we'd like to shorten the time. Do humans have to have anesthesia? So it depends on the application of the HIFU because thermal HIFU has been used in some instances as well in people for various applications. And I think it varies. So for some applications, they do have patients, human patients under anesthesia. And in some applications, they don't necessarily need it. Okay. Is this like a one and done deal? Like if we have a small tumor that you feel confident you can ablate in 30 minutes, do they have to come back? Is it a one-time treatment? So another wonderful question. I am afraid I can't give you an answer to that right now because our studies are so preliminary. I wish I could. Uh huh. Right. But we hope that that will be the case. But it may be that, you know, with at least in the early stages of the technology, we may have to split treatments up for very large tumors. Sure. Because unfortunately, there are cats and dogs that come to us with very substantially sized tumors. Mm -hmm. And so for those, it may be much more viable and feasible for the patient to carry out the treatment in various stages. Because it's not just the anesthesia at that point, but also the potential for too much tumor cell death all at one, uh -huh. which can be overwhelming for the body, for the immune system, for the patient. So I think a staged treatment could be a possible option in the future. Well, that leads me to a really important question. I know our listeners will want to know if their dogs are going to feel pain as a result of HIFU. Yeah, that's a, another great question. So we don't know definitively. Okay. What is being done in people with thermal HIFU is some people with bone lesions, and it could be benign lesions or metastatic bone lesion, bone tumors. Thermal HIFU has been given to people for alleviation of bone pain. Oh. Yeah. And so based on that information, we are hopeful that our veterinary patients, at least you know, in the specific tumor where I'm investigating, which is bone tumor, osteosarcoma, mm -hmm. that we can actually provide some pain alleviation and pain palliation because otherwise 
the treatment will not be viable as a limb salvage treatment because I could use the ultrasound to destroy cancer cells, but if it causes pain to a degree where it's um, not just maybe transient or temporary, you know, when we have surgery, we have some post-surgical pain that resolves with pain medication, et cetera. Sure. But if we cause an unacceptable level of pain with the treatment, then it's not a viable treatment. Yeah. People won't do it. Right. And I wouldn't do it for anyone. Right. So that's another important piece of information that we need. And so we have a clinical study that will open probably early next year Mm -hmm. for dogs with osteosarcoma. And it's um, for owners who have elected to decline all other standard treatments. Okay. So they're not going to get an amputation. Right. They're not going to do chemotherapy. Right. Those dogs could enroll in this study. Correct. Right. They're not getting radiation. They're not getting surgery. Essentially, because this is not a standard of care therapy, we couldn't enroll dogs whose owners are interested in standard of care therapy because it's not. Right. So it's only for owners who have declined other therapies, standard therapies for their dogs, and they can enroll in this trial where one of the goals for this trial is to find out what degree of pain alleviation, if any, these dogs experience after hysterotripsy ablation of their osteosarcoma tumors. Wonderful. Yeah. So we'll evaluate these dogs with various modalities, such as uh, we'll give owners questionnaires, we'll walk the dogs over gait analysis mats, Mm -hmm. et cetera, to try to assess the level of pain relief that we hopefully are providing. Well, that would be sort of a miracle upon a miracle to have a (laughs) non-invasive technique that addresses the tumor deep in the body without having to open the body up and then also provides pain relief as a result of the treatment and stimulates the immune system. That's all very, very exciting. So right now you're working with osteosarcoma. Yes. Are there any other cancer types that you envision would be able to take advantage of this perhaps later? Yes, absolutely. So a couple of my colleagues have been investigating the use of HIFU for soft tissue sarcomas in dogs and uh, more recently also in feline injection site associated sarcoma. Oh, wow. That's big, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a cat, but I have lots of cat lovers in my life. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's very upsetting for them when it happens. Right. Right. That sarcoma. Because it's a very locally aggressive disease. So absolutely. Yeah. So my colleagues are doing that. And I think that down the road in the near future, you know, we can think about investigating HIFU or histotripsy for, say, liver tumors like they have in people. And I think there can be other tumor types that we can think about exploring with this modality. And so the important thing is to gather the preliminary information so that we have a data set off of which we can then say, well, can we investigate this in this tumor type, for example? Right. What about hemangiosarcoma? Are you, is that on your radar? I know that's a big one for a lot of our listeners. Of course. Hemangiosarcoma is, yes, I understand it's, um, it's such a devastating tumor. So aggressive and bloody. Yes. Ugh. Yes. Very, very aggressive. And so, you know, it's hard for me to project down the road. Sure. But immediately, my personal opinion is that it wouldn't be the first tumor I would reach for Mm -hmm. to do early studies using high food. Okay. Because of the blood content in these tumors, Mm -hmm. the fluid content can be very challenging and also, you know, potentially risky. You'd be destroying a tumor that's in the lining of a blood vessel. So that hole you create in the blood vessel might cause an internal bleed. Right, right. Okay. And so I think that, you know, that's just the clinician side of me talking. (laughs) Yes. We don't have the data because we haven't investigated the use of it in hemangiosarcoma. But, you know, just the clinician side of me is hesitant to at least start with that. Who knows where we'll get to in the future? Sure. 
There might be another way of addressing that as you become more confident in the use of HIFU mm -hmm. in other cancer types, then other things can come in and be addressed that would make it more widely available. Potentially, yeah, absolutely. And with technology, you know, technology advances so quickly. Right. And so I think on the engineering side, you know, if we've got technology that eventually develops that could be suitable, then, you know, I think that it's unknown where we can go with this. And I think it's exciting, but that's probably not when I would start with. That makes sense to me. We're going to take a short break. And when we return, I want to get into aftercare for this treatment. A woman named Susie recently joined our dog cancer support group. And after receiving the book it's based on, she posted that she was leaving. Treating dog cancer is complex and overwhelming, she wrote. She just didn't have time for the group. Within half an hour, dozens of supportive comments appeared, urging Susie to stay, offering personal messages and reassuring her that her overwhelm was normal and natural and that she would get way more support than she could ever imagine. It is true. Our Facebook group called Dog Cancer Support is simply the best. With over 70% of its members active at any given time, it is filled with loving, kind people who embody the non-dogmatic, supportive, easygoing attitude that Dr. Dressler hopes we will all cultivate when it comes to dog cancer. If you haven't joined yet, go to dogcancersupport.com or search for the group called Dog Cancer Support in Facebook. Even if you don't have the book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide, join us. Oh yes, and of course, Susie stayed. And we're back with Dr. Tui discussing her work with HIFU or high intensity focused ultrasound. Dr. Tui, is there any aftercare people need to be prepared for? So I am most intimately aware of the data from my clinical trial with osteosarcoma patients. Mm -hmm. And so they do not so far appear to need any aftercare insofar as, you know, I do not have long-term data because right now our clinical trial is structured so that our dogs receive the histotripsy treatment to their tumor and they receive an amputation either 24 hours or three or five days after treatment. And so the timeline is very short, but what we have noted is that they do not seem to need extra pain medication or extra care after the histotripsy. And this is purely anecdotal. So I have to stress it's purely anecdotal, mm -hmm. but I've had um, a couple of owners mention to me that they felt that their dog seemed to be bearing more weight on that leg after the histotripsy. But that is very subjective and very anecdotal. Right. But we haven't had any need for extra pain medications or anything like that so far. So you mentioned that afterwards dogs are getting amputations. Is that so that you can give the treatment, give it a few days, and then have the leg taken off so they get their standard of care treatment for osteosarcoma? And then you have the tumor that you can examine and see how that treatment affected it? Correct. Yes, absolutely. So this clinical trial is set up so it doesn't interfere with a dog's ability to receive standard of care treatment. Okay, that's nice. And so that's why we only enroll dogs whose owners have elected for that. Right. For standard of care. And you're right, after we amputate the limb, our pathologist collaborator, of course, obtains cell samples for a diagnosis for the owner, but also will assess the areas where we have treated with histotripsy to assess what happens to the cells. Are we destroying the cells? Are the immune cells moving into the tumor more than we would have expected, for example? Mm -hmm. So those are the assessments we can make with the tumor after it's removed by the limb amputation. So is this the only study where people could participate at this point? If someone wanted to try this with their dog, would they contact you to enroll in that study and or the study next spring in 2023? Yes, they are very welcome to contact me or our clinical trials office. Okay. Mindy Quigley is our clinical trials coordinator and she's wonderful at giving clients information about studies. 
And so for osteosarcoma and histotripsy, yes, I would be the primary contact. But for a client who might be interested in HIFU or histotripsy for soft tissue sarcomas, they certainly can contact our clinical trials office. So again, our clinical trials coordinator will direct them to the principal investigators for those studies as well. Wonderful. We'll put the links to everything in the show notes so people can get it easily. I have two more questions. Do you have evidence of or do you know yet whether tumors tend to recur using this treatment? So for my studies, and I can only speak for them, that is not part of our assessment because the limbs get amputated. Uh So we do not know whether the tumors would recur after histotripsy treatment. Right. But that is a very important question to answer. There are many questions we need to answer down this path before we can establish it as a standard of care. Mm -hmm. But yes, you hit the nail on the head. That's an important question. Yeah. So if someone wanted to get this treatment and they were accepted into your trial, what's the estimated out-of-pocket cost for that client? Good question. So the clinical trial provides financial credit to the client of $2,000 towards the cost of a limb amputation surgery. And typically, for a very general estimate with us, the limb amputation surgery is somewhere between $35 and $4,500, typically. Okay. And so, you know, for the treatment part, that is the client's kind of estimated out-of-pocket, which is the 35 to 45 minus 2000 Okay. In order to qualify for the trial, a dog has to be determined to be free of metastatic disease. Okay. And the determination can be made by chest Mm x-rays, which is the responsibility of the owner. Sure. They've often gotten those before they think about entering a clinical trial because they've been trying to figure out what's going on with their dog. And so they've probably already got those chest x-rays and have that before they enroll, they know. Well, it depends. Okay. We actually get a fair number of owners who decide they would rather just kind of get all their diagnostics done with us at the initial appointment, which they're very welcome to do. Mm -hmm. So we can do that for them. And we also offer full body CT scans Uh for the interested owner because for osteosarcoma, unfortunately, it likes to metastasize to the lungs, Yeah. but also it can metastasize to other bones. Right. And so it's a low percentage. At the moment, you know, we're estimating maybe 8%, 8, 10% of the time. And so the full body CT, we can see from head to toe. Right. Basically. And so owners can elect to do that as well. And if an owner elects to do that for their dog, and then subsequently they end up enrolling their dog in the study, Mm -hmm. we will credit the owner with $700 towards that CT scan cost as well. Okay. So when crossing fingers, these are out of trials, Mm -hmm. and you and your colleagues have established this is safe and and becomes a standard of care, is this a technology that will need to be in a large specialty hospital? Is the equipment very expensive? How much do you think it will cost? Is it going to be comparable to radiation? I know I just asked a lot of questions, but they're sort of all the same thing. Yeah. This comes true. How much are we going to be paying for it? Right, right. And I honestly do not know. Mm -hmm. But yes, in the foreseeable future, at least when we, we, you know, if we first introduce this technology, it will only be available at very select places that have the ability to have the equipment and also the expertise to deliver it. But all of these specialized equipment and expertise, they have to start somewhere. I imagine when radiation treatment first started, and this is just in my imagination, it probably started also small and then we start growing it. Yeah. So the machines and the, and the radiation oncologists, we start to grow that population more. And so it's more readily available by the year. And so I would envision that this technology would go the same way, a very similar way. We have to start at, at probably very limited number of institutions mm-hmm. or high-end referral specialty clinics with the ability and the personnel to deliver it. That's my prediction. And then maybe grow it. As far as cost, unfortunately, I, I do not have a clue. 
There's so many factors that go into cost. Yes. For any treatment, for sure. My last question is about Haifu or any other topic. Is there anything that you want to say directly to our listeners who are facing dog cancer? Is there any, like, what's your biggest piece of advice? Well, I think that it's always good for all of us as pet owners and as maybe, you know, I hope it never happens, but as patients or family members of patients, you know, in, in medical care and in veterinary care, I think, you know, it's always good to kind of be open to exploring different options and then seeking opinions from your doctor or if, you know, your doctor needs to then make a referral, be open to that as well. And for owners who are interested in clinical trials to look at websites, usually they are occurring at universities. Mm -hmm. So looking at websites of various universities, there are many trials ongoing at the big veterinary teaching hospitals for osteosarcoma and different cancers. And so I think that just seeking information and then talking to your doctor and, you know, we can get all kinds of information from the web, right? but seeking to to kind of distill that information to what is helpful to my own pet, for example, if I were an owner, would be important. Yes, that's one of our goals here is to take all of the information out there and filter it through the greatest minds in veterinary science and make sure that everybody understands it clearly and then can speak to their own veterinarian in order to see if it works or would apply in their dog situation because everybody's case is so different. Exactly. And there's no one side. I really wish there were. I, I wish I had a magic wand. Right. And then I wish that this was a technical challenge. I like to say cancer is not a technical challenge. It's an adaptive challenge. It changes and we have to change in order to address it. It's not straightforward. I wish it were. I wish it were too, but... Yes, it's a very complex disease, cancer. Yes, and that's one of the reasons I'm excited about the research you're doing because it actually feels closer to a technical solution than a lot of other treatments. The idea that you could do something that would destroy the tumor, stimulate the immune system, provide pain relief, and then possibly not have a lot of side effects like other treatments can have a lot of side effects. That's pretty close to ideal cancer treatments. Well, that's always our hope. Right. But I do think that realistically, cancer being such a complex disease will most likely, for the foreseeable future, we are we are looking at multimodal therapy. So I would love histotripsy to be able to accomplish everything and be the cure-all or focus ultrasound. But I think that to maximize treatment impact for our patients for best outcomes, Mm -hmm. I think we're probably still looking at multimodal therapy. So maybe histotripsy or focused ultrasound combined with another immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, combination therapy is important because cancer, it's not just one molecule or one receptor. So I think there's always going to be a team effort in trying to treat cancer. Yes. 100%. And that's why it's important to have excellent team members that you trust. And um, I'm really glad that you came on our show today to speak to our listeners. And I want you to come back when you have more news about Haifu. Will you do that? Thank you. I would love to. I would love to hear how things go. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, listener. High-intensity focused ultrasound may not be widely available right now in early 2023, but clinical trials like the ones Dr. Chewy's working on will help to answer questions we still have about this therapy and hopefully bring it to veterinary hospitals near you. Check out the show notes for links to learn more about the current clinical trials and be sure to visit us on dogcancer.com to find more exciting treatments that are in the wings. If your dog's been enrolled in a clinical trial, we would love to hear from you about your experience. You can leave a message on our listener line at 808-868-3200 and we'll get back to you to feature your dog on a future episode. I'm Molly Jacobson and from all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. 
If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network.